relationship. That is, apart from its relational essence. But a pattern lacks simplicity in another sense, in which R176 a sensum retains simplicity. The realization of a pattern necessarily involves the concurrent realization of a group of eternal objects capable of contrast in that pattern. The realization of the pattern is through the realization of this contrast. The realization might have occurred by means of another contrast in the same pattern, but some complex contrast in that pattern is required. But the realization of a sensum in its ideal shallowness of intensity, with zero width, does not require any other eternal object, other than its intrinsic apparatus of individual and relational essence, it can remain just itself, with its unrealized potentialities for patterned contrasts. An actual entity with this absolute narrowness has an ideal faintness of satisfaction, differing from the ideal zero of chaos, but equally impossible. For realization means ingression in an actual entity, and this involves the synthesis of all ingredients with data derived from a complex universe. Realization is ideally distinguishable from the ingression of contrasts, but not in fact. The simplest grade of actual occasions must be conceived as experiencing a few sensa, with the minimum of pattern contrast. The sensor then experienced emotionally, and constitutes the specific feelings whose intensities sum up into the unity of satisfaction. In such occasions the process is deficient in its highest phases, the process is the slave to the datum. There is the individualizing phase of conformal feeling, but the originative phases of supplementary and conceptual feelings are negligible. Section IV. According to this account, the experience of the simplest grade of actual entity is to be conceived as the unoriginative response to the datum with its simple content of sensa. The datum is simple, because it presents the objectified experiences of the past under the guise of simplicity. Occasions A, B, and C enter into the experience of occasion M as themselves. Experiencing 177, Sensa 81 and 82 unified by some faint contrast between 81 and 82, occasion M responsibly feels Sensa 81 and 82 as its own sensation. There is thus a transmission of sensation emotion from A, B, and C to M. If M had the wit of self-analysis, M would know that it felt its own. Discussions and Applications 116 Sensa, by reason of a transfer from A, B, and C to itself. Thus the unconscious direct perception of A, B, and C is merely the causal efficacy of A, B, and C as elements in the constitution of M. Such direct perception will suffer from vagueness, for if A, B, and C tell the same tale with minor variation of intensity, the discrimination of A, and B, and C from each other will be irrelevant. There may thus remain a sense of the causal efficacy of actual presences, whose exact relationships in the external world are shrouded. Thus the experience of M is to be conceived as a quantitative emotion arising from the contribution of sensa from A, B, C and proportionately conformed to by M. Generalizing from the language of physics, the experience of M is an intensity arising out of specific sensa, directed from A, B, C. There is in fact a directed influx from A, B, C of quantitative feeling, arising from specific forms of feeling. 
The experience has a vector character, a common measure of intensity, and specific forms of feelings conveying that intensity. If we substitute the term, energy, for the concept of a quantitative emotional intensity, and the term, form of energy, for the concept of, specific form of feeling, and remember that in physics, vector, means definite transmission from elsewhere, we see that this metaphysical description of the simplest elements in the constitution of actual entities agrees absolutely with the general principles according to which the notions of modern physics are framed. The datum in metaphysics is the basis of the vector theory in physics. The quantitative satisfact ion in metaphysics is the basis of the scalar localization of energy in physics. The sensa in metaphysics are the basis of the diversity of specific forms under which energy flows itself. Psi 178 entific descriptions are, of course, entwined with the specific details of geometry and physical laws, which arise from the special order of the cosmic epoch in which we find ourselves. But the general principles of physics are exactly what we should expect as a specific exemplification of the metaphysics required by the philosophy of organism. It has been a defect in the modern philosophies that they throw no light whatever on any scientific principles. Science should investigate particular species, and metaphysics SHQULD investigate the generic notions under which those specific principles should fall. Yet, modern realisms have had nothing to say about scientific principles, and modern idealisms have merely contributed the unhelpful suggestion that the phenomenal world is one of the inferior avocations of the absolute. The direct perception whereby the datum and the immediate subject is inherited from the past can thus, under an abstraction, be conceived as the transference of throbs of emotional energy, clothed in the specific forms provided by sensa. Since the vagueness in the experience subject will veil the separate objectifications wherein there are individual contributions to the total satisfaction, the emotional energy in the final satisfaction wears the aspect of a total intensity capable of all gradations of ideal variation. But in its origin it represents the totality arising from the contributions of organisms and environment. 117. Separate objects to that form of energy. Thus, having regard to its origin, a real atomic structure of each form of energy is discernible, so much from each objectified actual occasion, and only a finite number of actual occasions will be relevant. This direct perception, characterized by mere subjective responsiveness and by lack of origination in the higher phases, exhibits the constitution of an actual entity under the guise of receptivity. In the language of causation, it describes the efficient causation operative in the actual world. In the language of epistemology, as framed by Locke, it describes how the ideas of particular 179 existence are absorbed into the subjectivity of the percipient and are the datum for its experience of the external world. In the language of science, it describes how the quantitative intensity of localized energy bears in itself the vector marks of its origin, and the specialities of its specific forms. It also gives a reason for the atomic quanta to be discerned in the building up of a quantity of energy. In this way, the philosophy of organism as it should appeals to the facts. Section B. The current accounts of perception are the stronghold of modern metaphysical difficulties. 
They have their origin in the same misunderstanding which led to the incubus of the substance quality categories. Categories. The Greeks looked at a stone, and perceived that it was gray. The Greeks were ignorant of modern physics, but modern philosophers discuss perception in terms of categories derived from the Greeks. The Greeks started from perception in its most elaborate and sophisticated form, namely, visual perception. In visual perception, true perception is most completely made over by the originative phases in experience, phases which are especially prominent in human experience. If we wish to disentangle the two earlier prehensive phases the receptive phases, namely, the datum and the subjective response from the more advanced originative phases, we must consider what is common to all modes of perception, amid the bewildering variety of originative amplification. On this topic I am content to appeal to Hume. He writes, but my senses convey to me only the impressions of colored points, disposed in a certain manner. If the eye is sensible of anything further, I desire it may be pointed out to me. One and again, it is universally allowed by the writers on optics, that the eye at all times sees an equal number of physical points, and that a man's 180 on the top of a mountain has no larger an image presented to his senses than when he is cooped up in the narrowest quarter chamber. 2. In each of these quotations Hume explicitly asserts that the eye sees. 1 treatise, BK, I, plus part 2, sex. 3. Italics not his. 2 treatise, BK. I, part 3, sex, ix, asterisk, 118, discussions and applications. The conventional comment on such a passage is that Hume, for the sake of intelligibility, is using common forms of expression, that he is only really speaking of impressions on the mind, and that in the dim future, some learned scholar will gain reputation by amending, I, into, ego. The reason for citing the passages is to enforce the thesis that the form of speech is literary and intelligible because it expresses the ultimate truth of animal perception. The ultimate momentary, ego, has as its datum the, I is experiencing such and such sights. In the second quotation, the reference to the number of physical points is a reference to the excited area on the retina. Thus the, I is experiencing such and such sights is passed on as a datum, from the cells of the retina, through T the train of actual entities forming the relevant nerves, up to the brain. Any direct relation of eye to brain is entirely overshadowed by this intensity of indirect transmission. Of course this statement is merely a pale abstraction from the physiological theory of vision. But the physiological account does not pretend to be anything more than indirect inductive knowledge. The point here to be noticed is the immediate literary obviousness of the eye is experiencing such and such sights. This is the very reason why Hume uses the expression in spite of his own philosophy. The conclusion, which the philosophy of organism draws, is that in human experience the fundamental fact of perception is the inclusion, in the datum, of the objectification of an antecedent part of the human body with such and such experiences. Hume agrees with this conclusion t sufficiently well so as to argue from it, when it suits his purpose. He writes, I would fain ask those philosophers, 
who found so much of their reasonings on the distinction 181 of substance and accident, and imagine we have clear ideas of each, whether the idea of substance be derived from the impressions of sensation or reflection. If it be conveyed to us by our senses, I ask, which of them, and after what manner? If it be perceived by the eyes, it must be a color, if by the ears, a sound, if by the palate, a taste, and so of the other senses. Point three, we can prolong Hume's list. The feeling of the stone is in the hand, the feeling of the food is the ache in the stomach, the compassionate yearning is in the bowels, according to biblical writers, the feeling of well-being is in the viscera passum, ill temper is the emotional tone derivative from the disordered liver. In this list, Hume's and its prolongation, for some cases as in sight, for example the supplementary phase in the ultimate subject overbalances in importance the datum inherited from the eye. In other cases, as in touch, the datum of, the feeling in the hand, maintains its importance, however much the intensity, or even the character, of the feeling may be due to supplementation in the ultimate subject, this instance should be contrasted with that of sight. In the instance of the ache the stomach, as, free treatise, BK, I, part 1, sect, B. Organisms and Environment. 119. Datum is of chief importance, and the food though obscurely felt is secondary at least, until the intellectual analysis of the situation due to the doctor, professional or amateur. In the instances of compassion, well-being, and ill-temper, the supplementary feelings in the ultimate subject predominate, though there are obscure references to the bodily organs as inherited data. This survey supports the view that the predominant basis of perception is perception of the various bodily organs, as passing on their experiences by channels of transmission and of enhancement. It is the accepted doctrine in physical science that a living body is to be interpreted according to what is known of other sections of the physical universe. This is a sound axiom, but it 182 is double-edged. For it carries with it the converse deduction that other sections of the universe are to be interpreted in accordance with what we know of the human body. It is also a sound rule that all interpretation should be based upon a vera causa. Now the original reliance upon the gray stone has been shown by modern physics to be due to a misapprehension of a complex situation, but we have direct knowledge of the relationship of our central intelligence to our bodily feelings. According to this interpretation, the human body is to be conceived as a complex amplifier to use the language of the technology of electromagnetism. The various actual entities which compose the body are so coordinated that the experiences of any part of the body are transmitted to one or more central occasions to be inherited with enhancements accruing upon the way, are finally added by reason of the final integration. The enduring personality is the historic root of living occasions which are severally dominant in the body at successive instants. The human body is thus achieving on a scale of concentrated efficiency a type of social organization, which with every gradation of efficiency constitutes the orderliness whereby a cosmic epic shelters in itself intensity of satisfaction. The crude aboriginal character of direct perception is inheritance. What is inherited is feeling tone with evidence of its origin, in other words, vector feeling tone.
In the higher grades of perception vague feeling tone differentiates itself into various types of sense of those of touch, sight, smell, etc. Each transmuted into a definite prehension of tonal contemporary nexus by the final percipient. Section B. In principle, the animal body is only the more highly organized and immediate part of the general environment for its dominant actual occasion, which is the ultimate by 83 percipient. But the transition from without to within the body marks the passage from lower to higher grades of actual occasion. The higher the grade, the more vigorous and the more the original is the enhancement from the supplementary phase. Pure Recept. 120. Discussions and Applications. Activity and transmission give it place to the trigger action of life whereby there is release of energy in novel forms. Thus the transmitted datum acquires sensa enhanced in relevance or even changed in character by the passage from the low-grade external world into the intimacy of the human body. The datum transmitted from the stone becomes the touch feeling in the hand, but it preserves the vector characted of its origin from the stone. The touch feeling in the hand with this vector origin from the stone is transmitted to the percipient in the brain. Thus the Fina 1 perception is the perception of the stone through the touch in the hand. Eerie this perception the stone is vague and faintly relevant in comparison with the hand. But, however dim, it is there. In the transmission of inheritance from a to be, to see, to be, A is objectified by the eternal object 5 is a datum for B, where 5 is a sensum or a complex pattern of sensa. Then B is objectified for C. But the datum for B is thereby capable of some relevance for C, namely, A is objectified for B becomes reobjectified for C, and so on to D, and throughout the line of objectifications. Then for the ultimate subject M the datum includes A is thus transmitted, B is thus transmitted, and so on. The final objectifica. Tions for M are effected by a set 51T of eternal objects which is a modification of the original group 5. The modification consists partly in relegation of elements into comparative irrelevance, Partly in enhancement of relevance for other elements, partly in supplementation by eliciting into important relevance some eternal objects not in the original five. Generally there will be vagueness in the distinction between A, and B, and C, and D, etc., in their function as components in the datum for M. Some of the line, A and C for instance, may stand out P84 with distinctness by reason of some peculiar feat of original supplementation which retains its undimmed importance in subsequent transmission. Other members of the chain may sink into oblivion. For example, in touch there is a reference to the stone in contact with the hand, and a reference to the hand, but in normal, healthy, bodily operations the chain of occasions along the arm sinks into the background, almost into complete oblivion. Thus M, which has some analytic consciousness of its datum, is conscious of the feeling in its hand as the hand touches the stone. According to this account, Perception in its primary form is consciousness of the causal efficacy of the external world by reason of which the percipient is a concrescence from a definitely constituted datum. The vector character of the datum is this causal efficacy. Thus perception, in this primary sense, is perception of the settled world in the past as constituted by its feeling tones, and as efficacious by reason of those feeling tones.
Perception, in this sense of the term, will be called perception in the mode of causal efficacy. Memory is an example of perception in this mode. For memory is perception relating to the data from some historic root of ultimate percipient subjects MI, M2, MG, etc., leading up to M which is the memorizing percipient. Organisms and Environment 121 Section 7 It is evident that perception in the mode of causal efficacy is not that sort of perception which has received chief attention in the philosophical tradition. Philosophers have disdained the information about the universe obtained through their visceral feelings and have concentrated on visual feelings. What we ordinarily term our visual perceptions are the result of the later stages in the concrescence of the percipient occasion. When we register in consciousness our visual perception of a gray stone, something more than bare sight is meant. The stone has a reference 185 to its past, when it could have been used as a missile if small enough, or as a seat if large enough. A stone has certainly a history, and probably a future. It is one of the elements in the actual world which has got to be referred to as an actual reason and not as an abstract potentiality. But we all know that the mere sight involved in the perception of the grey stone is the sight of a grey shape contemporaneous with the percipient and with certain spatial relations to the percipient more or less vaguely defined. Thus the mere sight is confined to the illustration of the geometrical perspective relatedness of a certain contemporary spatial region to the percipient, the illustration being effected by the mediation of gray. The sense of gray rescues that region from its vague confusion with other regions. Perception which merely by means of a sensum, rescues from vagueness a contemporary spatial region, in our respect to its spatial shape and its spatial perspective from the percipient, will be called perception in the mode of presentational immediacy. Perception in this mode has already been considered in Part 2, Chapter 2. A more elaborate discussion of it can now be undertaken point for the definition, which has just been given, extends beyond the particular case of sight. The unraveling of the complex interplay between the two modes of perception causal efficacy and presentational immediacy is one main problem of the theory of perception. Point five, the ordinary philosophical discussion of perception is almost wholly concerned with this interplay and ignores the two pure modes which are essential for its proper explanation. The interplay between the two modes will be termed symbolic reference. 186 such symbolic reference is so habitual in human experience that great care is required to distinguish the two modes. In order to find O. 5. 4 also CF. T subsequent discussions in parts 3 and IV. CF. My Barber Page Lectures, Symbolism, Its Meaning and Effect, delivered at the University of Virginia, April, 1927, New York, Macmillan, 1927, Cambridge University Press, 1928. Plus another discussion of this question is there undertaken, with other illustrations. CF. Also Professor Norman Kemp Smith's Prolegomena to an Idealist Theory of Knowledge, Macmillan, 1924. 122. Discussions and Applications Bias examples of the pure mode of causal efficacy we must have recourse to the viscera and to memory, 
And to find examples of the pure mode of presentational immediacy we must have recourse to so-called elusive perceptions. For example, the image of